Right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I want to thank you all for uh, coming this afternoon uh, to listen to this presentation of Case Notes. My name is Jaco Vedler. I'm the 38th Editor-in-Chief of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. And this event is the second in what we hope will become a biannual series of presentations uh, of uh, works produced by members of the journal. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, and I'll try to keep my comments brief, because I have a tendency to ramble, uh, I want to thank Jim Colzer, who couldn't be here because he lives in California, and Ray Wade and the Admiralty and Maritime Law Committee of the ABA's Tort Trial and Insurance Practice section for helping us put the event together, promoting it, supporting us while we sought CLE accreditation for all of the attorneys in attendance. And um, second, I, I would really love to thank Dean Meyer, uh, first, for all of the support you've given us throughout this year and um, for having the foresight to suggest that we seek CLE accreditation so that we could have such a fantastic turnout. Uh, I want to thank you all for attending this event. And last but certainly not least, I want to uh, thank the seven journal junior members uh, who agreed perhaps under duress and perhaps with just a little bit of pressure to come and speak with you all tonight. Uh, this is a great opportunity for them and, and I thank you guys for doing this. Um, this event gives journal members the opportunity to interact with practitioners in a creative new way, a way that we have never interacted with the bar. And uh, it's a very successful event so far and proof of the event's success is that we've received numerous phone calls and emails from practitioners in the community asking for advanced copies of uh, work that the students have produced. And this is, I mean, that, that was more than we could have asked for. I mean, what we wanted was attorneys to come and listen to what we had to say. And what we got is even more interest in the written scholarship we produce. So I think uh, there couldn't be a better uh, turnout than, than we've had so far. Uh, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. In, in case anyone did not get a CLE registration form, please, please get one before you leave and make sure to give them back to me before you leave so that I can turn them into the CLE office. Um, also, the materials that we've distributed are drafts uh, that are in the middle of the editing process and will be available in print in late April uh, in Volume 38, Issue 2 of the journal. Uh, we would kindly ask that you please save any questions that you have for the presenters until the reception to follow, and uh, we hope you all enjoy the event. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lara Beck. I'm a 2L and a junior member of the journal. I went to the Louisiana State Bar Association Admiralty Symposium where I heard that punitive damages in maritime law was going to be a hot topic. And so when McBride came out in early October, I decided to write my case note on it. Uh, notably, McBride has been granted en banc hearing just last month um, and oral arguments are scheduled for mid-May. A brief summary of the facts of this case are that Estes Rig 23 a barge carrying a truck mounted drilling rig was conducting drilling operations in a navigable waterway in Louisiana. One night, the monkey board, which is a catwalk above the truck in the arm of the derrick, shifted and pipe in the derrick shifted. The next day, when crew members were attempting to straighten it, um, the rig and truck toppled over, fatally pinning Sky Sunnier. Haley McBride filed suit on behalf of the estate in the Western District of Louisiana. She alleged claims of unseaworthiness under the general maritime law and negligence under the Jones Act for which she sought compensatory as well as punitive and or exemplary damages. Uh, the magistrate judge granted the de defendant's motion to strike the claims for punitive damages but granted interlocutory appeal because the issues are the subject of a national debate with no clear consensus. Without deciding whether punitive damages are available under the Jones Act, the Fifth Circuit held that punitive damages are an available remedy under the general maritime uh, cause of unseaworthiness. I found a timeline helpful for understanding the historical background of the case, so I've shared it um, with you all today. It has on it only Supreme Court cases, the top of which is uh, related to Siemens personal injury and the bottom which relates to punitive damages. And so to start, we all know maintenance and cure is the oldest of the Siemens remedies. Um, it exists without fault. And until the Osceola in 1903, that was generally regarded as the Siemens 
limit to recovery for inju injuries sustained in the service of the ship. In the Osceola, a crew member sued for injuries while uh, he followed the master's order to hoist a gangway in heavy winds. And the claimant didn't allege that the vessel was unseaworthy, pardon me, unseaworthy, but he alleged only his employer's negligence. Uh, the court denied the claim for negligence for his employer, um, but stated and dicted that he could recover from the ship owner for unseaworthiness of the vessel. Uh, Congress responded in 1920 by passing the Jones Act, and the Jones Act grants seamen a right to damages for injuries caused by the negligence of their employer. And even after the passage of the Jones Act, you'll see in a pair of cases, the Pinar del Rio and Pacific Steamship Company, uh, unseaworthiness was limit limited to a condition of the vessel, and it did not include operational negligence. For example, in the Pinar del Rio, the court held that the mate's selection of a defective rope did not constitute unseaworthiness. And then about uh, a couple decades later in Manic, the court dramatically changed directions with regard to unseaworthiness in two key aspects. First, they began including operational negligence, ironically on exactly the same facts as the Pinar del Rio, the mate's selection of a defective rope. And second, they announced that unseaworthiness was a strict liability rule Knowledge of or opportunity to correct unseaworthy conditions are irrelevant. And so now in Usner, the latest case, the Supreme Court basically announced that unseaworthiness is a catch-all. Uh, your crew could be unfit, your gear unfit, uh, the manner or of your cargo stowage could be unfit. Any of these reasons could constitute unseaworthiness. And that prompted Justice Harlan in his dissent to remark that um, he would invite a thoroughgoing re-examination of the developments of the unseaworthiness doctrine. And about the same time, also professors Gilmore and Black acknowledged that unseaworthiness and Jones Act are Siamese twins. Even so, the anomaly created by the overlapping causes of action was alleviated for three major reasons. First, because whether judge or jury was the fact finder, the same fact finder could resolve all the claims at once. Second, because there could be no double recovery. And third, because when the Supreme Court announced a uniformity principle, damages under either the Jones Act or negligence were virtually identical. Next on the timeline, you see the punitive damages cases. Um, in 1818, well before unseaworthiness was even established, uh, the crew of a brig robbed, plundered, and brutally beat the crew of the amiable Nancy. Uh, and the ship owner was found only construct constructively liable, and Justice Story famously said that it might be proper to go yet further and visit upon the original wrongdoers in the shape of exemplary damages, the proper punishment which belongs to such lawless misconduct. The Supreme Court has never squarely addressed the availability of punitive damages in an unseaworthiness action. Uh, the closest it came is Miles. In Miles, uh, the court held that Loss of society damages were not available for a Siemens unseaworthiness action where the Jones Act did not, did not provide for those same damages, essentially <laughs> urging uniformity with respect to remedies and deference to congressional legislation in the same area of law. Later in Townsend, the court five to four held that punitive damages are an available remedy for the arbitrary withholding of maintenance and cure. The majority based that decision on the fact that uh, the amiable Nancy allowed punitive damages in the general maritime law, and because maintenance and cure existed prior to the Jones Act, and the Jones Act does not address or purport to limit the available remedies of maintenance and cure, uh, it felt free to decide the issue. The dissent argued strenuously that it saw no reason to depart from the Miles uniformity principle. It found the cases relied on by the majority for the historical availability of punitive, punitive damages insufficient in number, clarity, and prominence to justify departure from Miles. So I think that fairly frames the issues um, for the background. In McBride, the panel adopted the straightforward rule of Townsend and performed a bit of ad-libs by substituting the word unseaworthiness for maintenance and cure in the court's holding in that case. Uh, it looked to a case Mary Shipping where it had decided in the 1970s that punitive damages could be available for un unseaworthiness. Mary's shipping was based on, again, the amiable Nancy, and also public policy reasons, and the court in McBride demonstrated that before Mary's shipping, both the Second and Sixth Circuits had allowed punitive damages, and after Mary's shipping, the Ninth and Eleventh Circuits followed suit. 
even if they were usually denied on the facts. So I have three main criticisms of the court's decision in McBride. Uh, first, I think that uh, the court doesn't cite any direct authority, case law or otherwise, for the proposition that punitive damages ever were actually awarded in a seaman's unseaworthiness cause of action. And at least in Townsend, there was some sparse historical basis for holding so. And there's also dicta in several Supreme Court cases suggesting that unseaworthiness is limited to compensatory damages, and I think that should have given the court greater pause. Second, adopting Townsend's maintenance and cure holding for unseaworthiness overlooks the distinct nature of the claims. Maintenance and cure arises from completely separate facts. It's the failure to pay a contractual obligation, and whereas unseaworthiness relates to the negligence and the unseaworthy conditions of the vessel um, for compensatory purposes. Third, the purposes of maintenance and cure and unseaworthiness are different. Maintenance and cure is a remedy that spurs ship owners into action. It's effective immediately so that the seaman can get the medical care that he needs. And there might be overwhelming public policy reasons to allow punitive damages <coughs> for maintenance and cure that don't arise under unseaworthiness because unseaworthiness is merely a compensatory remedy. And finally, although the Supreme, although the court's conclusion that punitive damages require a finding of wanton and willful misconduct overlooks the fact that Congress has criminalized unseaworthiness by statute. 46 U.S.C. section 10908 provides that a person who knowingly sends an unseaworthy vessel to sea that is likely to endanger the life of an individual shall be fined not more than $1,000 and imprisoned for not more than five years or both. In my opinion, that provides the right penalty in these kinds of cases. And I was asked to make a prediction about the en banc rehearing, what I think will happen. And I predict reversal. I think that Miles, the Supreme Court in Miles was, pardon me, the Supreme Court in Townsend was clear that Miles remains sound. And I think that the court underplays the overlapping nature of the Jones Act and unseaworthiness. And it's true that the Jones Act does not address unseaworthiness, but the court's development of the unseaworthiness doctrine has addressed the Jones Act. And so if the court does uphold the decision, I would really like to see a fleshing out of the public policy reasons they feel why punitive damages should be available as a matter of judge-made law. Good evening, my name is James Dumont. I'm a third year law student and a junior member of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. I found my case for Toll SA versus Prime Row Shipping Company from a list of suggested topics. It caught my attention as it involves the pleading standard required for piercing the corporate veil of a polluting ship owner and the enforcement of a foreign award. One of the most perplexing areas of the law for courts, practitioners, and scholars alike these days is determining when to pierce the corporate veil and under which circumstances the court should find shareholders, alter egos, and corporate owners liable for the, for the faults of their corporations. Vitol SA is an international commodities and, commodities and energy trader who obtained a $6.1 million judgment from the English High Court of Justice Commercial Court in 2005 against Capri Marine stemming from the breached warranties of seaworthiness which caused an oil spill in Estonia in 2001. During that litigation, the offending vessel, the MV Alhambra, was sold by Capri Marine to a shell company of the Kologi Ratos Group, an alleged alter ego of all the parties involved tonight, uh, for $2 million as the alleged fair market value. That $2 million was put up to the English court to satisfy part of the award to the toll. While litigation was still ongoing in the English court, the Star Lady, the shell company, uh, turned around and sold that vessel for $3 million to a bona fide third party. That additional $1 million was not given to the, to the court for the fund. In 2009, Vitol came to the United States seeking $9 million after the interest and the enforcement of the English award. It arrested the MV Thor in Maryland, arguing that its owner, Spartacus Navigation Corporation, and its manager, Prime Row Shipping, were merely alter egos owned, dominated, and controlled by the Kologi Ratos Group. Thereafter, Prime Row's, the manager of the vessel, posted a $9 million bond for the, for the release of the vessel. After the vessel was released, Prime Rose and Spartacus moved for a Rule 
E2 rule E dismissal and a 12B uh, rule E vacature of the of the attachment and a rule 12B6 dismissal. Spartacus uh, Prime Rose was granted leave or sorry, excuse me. Vitol was granted leave by the court to file an amended verified complaint, which it did in 2011, in which it had 30 pages of alleged facts and allegations purporting to show the close business relationship and between all the parties involved. After, argue, after arguably defrauding the English court in Vitola of the additional $1 million from that alleged sham sale of the MV Alhambra, that $1 million was allegedly put up by the Kologi Ratos Group along with $100 million other dollars to found and start Prime Row Shipping Company in the nominal ownership of one of their ship longtime shipbrokers, Mr. Veliades. And along with this, the court, uh, Vitola alleged that that startup fund was made with undocumented, uncollateralized, and unrepaid loans. Further, moreover even, Vitola alleged that the parties all shared the same office space, email addresses, telephone numbers, commingled funds, and continuously disregarded the corporate form by giving each other further undocumented, uncollateralized, and unrepaid loans. Vitola also pointed the court's attention to a Texas case in which Mr. Veliades himself, under oath, had denied having anything more than managerial control over Prime Rose and its fleet. Thereafter, the district court again dismissed the case, this time stating that Prime Rose had failed to allege sufficient, or the toll had failed to allege sufficient facts to show that Prime Rose and Spartacus were alter egos of Capri Marine and or the Kologi Ratos group. The Fourth Circuit took the case up on appeal, uh, examining Supplemental Rule E, the Supplemental Rule E procedures, and its own directives for when to pierce the corporate veil. The Fourth Circuit in Mondragon, Mondragon rather, found Rule E2A requires a complaint at bottom alleged sufficient facts so a defendant could frame a responsive pleading and commence a meaningful investigation of the facts. Supplemental Rule E2A requires that uh, is the pleading standard which has been recently overturned by the Fourth Circuit. Rule E4F works in tandem with Rule E2A. E4F provides that a ship owner can't, who has had their vessel arrested is entitled to a prompt hearing at which the claimant must show why arrest should not be vacated. These two mechanisms work in tandem to prevent the undue, the continuing undue burden or hardship on the ship owner in the event of the improper use of admiralty seizure proceedings. Prior to Bell v. Twombly, the courts had required that plaintiffs merely allege sufficient facts establishing a reasonable belief that a claim had merit. Yet Bell v. Twombly, and eventually its hmm, transformation under Ashcroft v. Iqbal, abolished the 50-year reign of the reasonable standard in favor of the new plausibility standard. The court, relying on Twombly's plausibility standard, then evaluated Arctic Ocean, a 2009 uh, Second Circuit case uh, out of New York, and Aqua Stoli, 2006, which came before Bell v. Twombly, uh, to determine what are reasonable veil-piercing factors throughout the nation. This included the disregard of corporate formalities, inadequate capitalization, as was here, the toll, uh, Capri's only asset was the MV Alhambra, intermingling of funds, common office space, shared telephone numbers, and shared email address, as well as an overlap in officers and directors, and whether the, they treat each other as independent profit centers. Some of this may sound familiar. Ultimately, the Fourth Circuit found that Vitol had failed to allege sufficient facts to nudge their claim across the line from conceivable to plausible. That is the quote from Bell v. Twombly, and that is the new plausibility standard. You must push your claim across the line from conceivable to plausible. The plausibility standard announced by the Fourth Circuit and used in de de denying the claim to pierce the corporate veil or it was a bad decision because it relied on Maryland's reluctance to pierce the corporate veil. Maryland pierces the corporate veil in only 25.87% of cases. That is an opposite to the national average, which is just below 50%, largely brought down by Maryland. This has numerous worrying implications for the future, although it, is a, it does show that Rule E2A is now a strong defensive motion for defense attorneys. First, plaintiffs will rarely, if ever, be capable of alleging the requisite sufficient facts necessary to progress the discovery to even get their hands on the information that will usually that is requisite 
for showing the plausible pleading that the courts that the corporations are indeed alter egos of each other. Second, the Fourth Circuit decision further frustrates the purpose of the corporate veil doctrine by allowing corporations to abuse the corporate form with impunity. It should be noted that in 2008, Lloyd's Maritime Investigative Unit said that Kologi Ratos owns all of these companies. For some reason, that was left out of the pleadings in this case. Indeed, this reluctance to pierce, course, to pierce the corporate veil brings to light Justice Stevens' dissent in Belle Twombly, in which he said that, courts, that he feared that courts will dismiss cases based on the assurances of lawyers that they cannot, form, cannot investigate the allegations or frame a response Instead, requiring, instead of requiring knowledgeable executives to respond to factual allegations by way of sworn depositions or other limited discovery. Advances in technology such as the, the possibility of e-filing and VOIP or Skype, video conferencing can happen 24-7 around the world. Courts are recognizing this transition due to technological advances and it should not be that difficult to pull in a corporate officer or agent to have him affirm or to affirm or deny these allegations in a limited hearing, especially in such an E4F hearing. Lastly, this decision will potentially create nefarious consequences for states if they are ever fall victim to a marine pollution incident in which that incident has causes damages in excess of the value of the vessel. If they attempt to arrest a sis an alleged sister ship without having prior discovery as the toll did extensively, then courts will be, then defense attorneys for foreign ship owners will be able to allege that I don't have enough information in this pleading to form a response and therefore you should dismiss. States will not be able to recover the, their full cost and this will be a, a burden on the states. Thank you. I'm Destiny Fennin. I'm a 2L junior member on the journal this year. I really want to thank you all for coming out tonight to listen to our case note presentations. I decided to do my case note on Barker versus Hercules Offshore Incorporated and I thought that it was a very intriguing case because the court is presented with basically three issues and the court only definitively answers one of them and they explicitly decide to punt on the other two issues which involve a choice of law analysis and whether or not a zone of danger theory is an adequate cause of action under general maritime law. Before we get to those substantively, I want to lay out a little bit of the facts of the case. Francis Barker was employed on the Outer Continental Shelf on a jacked up drilling rig with his co-worker Broussard, and they were supposed to be putting in casing for the drilling process. However, before they could start this, they were told to remove a pollution pan. And the current industry custom is that the pan is welded self-sufficiently to the drilling rig, However, in this case, it was held on via metal straps, and not knowing this, Broussard was standing on the pan when he cut the straps, causing the pan and himself to fall all the way into the Gulf of Mexico over 100 feet below. Barker was standing about two feet from the pan when the incident happened, and he turned around in enough time to see Broussard strike a beam and ultimately fall to his death. Out of these facts, he alleged that he had emotional injuries or emotional distress and physical injuries resulting from that emotional damage. So he filed suit in Texas State Court and the defendants had it removed to a Texas District Court under Oxley's federal jurisdiction grant. Barker argued that this removal was improper because under general maritime law, the home state de defendant rule would apply and therefore preclude removal. In this case, the District Court and the Fifth Circuit on Appeal ultimately held that removal was proper and they also disposed of the case on a motion for summary judgment in favor of the defendants. I think that there are two areas of substantive law that are very important to the court's analysis in this case. The first of which is the application of Oxlo. Congress has established Oxlo with a very broad jurisdictional grant that gives the United States jurisdiction, control, and power of disposition over events arising on the outer continental shelf. And although initially the circuit courts had a little bit of confusion in when Oxlaw applied, the Supreme Court ultimately adopted the Ninth Circuit's view that in order for Oxlaw to be applicable to a case, they would have to establish that the injury was sufficiently tied to the extractive operations on the shelf. And in doing so, they rejected the Third Circuit's very broad but-for test and the Fifth Circuit's more narrow situs of injury test. And in this case, the court pretty quickly 
saw that there was a nexus between Barker's alleged injuries and the extractive operations on the jacked up drilling rig. So they held that OXLA was applicable. The second background law is um, the application of general maritime law. And basically, general maritime law applies of its own force by the Supreme Court's two-part testing through BART, which needs a, a proper situs and a sufficient nexus to traditional maritime activity. The Supreme Court has made it very clear that they are very hesitant to apply general maritime law in Oxla cases. They've held that it was Congress's intent to have federal law apply to these cases. And they've gone even one step further to say that general maritime law is particularly inept to deal with these kinds of claims. So it was based on this background that the Fifth Circuit went on with their analysis in this case. And the first issue that they dealt with was removal under Oxla. This is the only issue that they definitively decided on, and they held that the choice of law analysis was completely distinct and separate from the subject matter jurisdiction or removal question. They held that even if general maritime law did apply of its own force under Grubart, that it would only supplant federal and state law as to the substantive issues, that it would not supplant it as to the procedural mechanisms such as removal. And they looked at the text of Oxla itself, and as well as Congress's intent in wanting federal law to apply to this. And they even said that it would be a matter of national importance that it would benefit the nation to have federal courts deal with these claims, rather than have them in state court, even if that meant on removal grounds. And while this area of the decision is pretty clear cut in that they establish new law, that's basically where the court's clarity ends. The second issue that they moved on to was the choice of law analysis. And they said that it was completely irrelevant whether federal, state, or general maritime law applied because the result would be the same under all three of these. However, two of the judges decided to speak on it on their own. And Judge Clement said that she would not apply general maritime law in this case because it failed the second part of the Grubart test. And I feel like her concurrence was trying to draw a middle ground between the Fifth Circuit's very expansive view of when general maritime law applies and the Supreme Court's very narrow view of when general maritime law should apply, especially in Oxla cases. However, Judge Higginbotham really criticized her for this, saying that he would have gone with the Fifth Circuit's very expansive view, as typical Fifth Circuit precedent is, and he said that both of the prongs were met and she was just adding undue confusion to an area of settled Fifth Circuit law. However, I think that the interplay of the two judges shows that this is not a settled area, and it's especially an area where the Supreme Court is at odds and has expressly criticized the Fifth Circuit for covering everybody who breathes salt air with general maritime law. The court took a similar approach in the third issue, which was the zone of danger analysis, and they said that it didn't matter if it arose under Texas state law or general maritime law because Barker failed both tests. He didn't have a familial relation like the Texas test requires. And he also did not, the court held that he would not have been within a zone of danger for general maritime law purposes. However, the court did so without expressly saying whether or not this was even an applicable cause of action within general maritime law for the Fifth Circuit. They did say that some of their sister circuits have adopted this as a cause of action, but they said that they were going to basically let the lower courts kind of develop the issue and see where it goes from there. And I think that this just incites confusion and it invites very inconsistent judgments because now you can have a plaintiff on one set of facts who will be able to bring a cause of action under zone of danger theory because the judge believes that that's an adequate cause of action under general maritime law, whereas in the very next courtroom next door, the judge may not think that this is an applicable cause of action and they won't even allow the plaintiff to argue that. So I think that ultimately this decision is very concerning in that it punts basically on this issue and Judge Higginbotham is the only one who decided to speak on the issue. He said that he would apply the zone of danger test to general maritime law and he went through the other circuits and explained how they have been applying it in parallel with the Supreme Court's application of it in Gottschall and I think that at least it provides us with an, a non-arbitrary way to separate plaintiffs who have been in some way at least impacted by the defendant's negligence because they've been put within a zone created by that negligence from a plaintiff who was completely removed from the tortious conduct and therefore is not quite entitled to recovery for purely emotional damages. And I feel like emotional damages are a, a form of damages that the courts are very apprehensive to give out as it is. So we need a test that's going to be more palatable policy-wise 
for them to be able to apply and draw a clear line of when this cause of action will apply and when it will not. So I think that this decision leaves a lot to, a lot to, um, I'm sorry, ultimately the Fifth Circuit's approach um, was very helpful in terms of removal because they really worked out the complex interplay between OXLA and general maritime law and they definitively established new law in our circuit, which I think was great. But it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of the choice of law and the zone of danger theory where they punted it to the district courts. And it's ultimately going to cause problems for the lower courts and the practitioners. So I think that these are two issues that the court's going to have to address relatively soon to clear up any confusion that's going to arise from them. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Allison Fish and I'm a 2L junior member of the Maritime Journal. And when I first joined the journal, I really didn't know anything about maritime law. So in picking my case, I went to a list of suggested topics that had been provided for us. And the case I ultimately picked, Bunn versus Oldendorf Carriers out of the Fourth Circuit, was one of the cases on that list. And in reading the case and doing a little bit of research about it, I genuinely disagreed with the court's outcome, which is why I ultimately chose to write about it. So a little background for the case, it arose as a claim for recovery for injuries under the Longshore and Harbors Worker Compensation Act, or the LHWCA, and this was enacted by Congress in 1927, but it underwent major changes in 1972, and they eliminated the longshoremen's ability to sue for unseaworthiness and only retained their ability to sue in negligence. And they said that their reason for doing this was they wanted to shift the responsibility to the party best able to prevent these injuries, which is the stevedore employer. When they made these changes in 1972, however, they did not define what negligence meant under the act, but said this would instead be figured out through the ordinary process of litigation and through the application of accepted principles of tort law. So then in 1981, in a case called Cindy Esteem and Navigation Company versus De Los Santos, the Supreme Court defined what negligence meant under the act. And they said that ship owners owed gen three general duties to longshoremen, the first of which is the turnover duty of safe condition. And that's the only duty that's an issue in this case. And this duty just deals with the condition of vessels before cargo operations have begun. It requires that the ship owner exercise ordinary care under the circumstances to have a ship in a condition that an expert and experienced stevedore can carry on his operations with reasonable safety and the exercise of reasonable care. This turnover duty of safe condition includes a corollary duty to warn of latent hazards that the ship owner should have known about in the exercise of reasonable care. And the Supreme Court said in Cyndia that absent a contract provision, a positive law, or a custom to the contrary, a ship owner has no general duty to inspect or to supervise operations that have been assigned to the stevedore. So then in 1994, in a case called Hallett versus Birkdale Shipping Company, the Supreme Court fleshed out this corollary duty to warn again. And they did re-emphasize that it is a narrow duty that applies only to latent hazards. And they defined latent hazards as those that are not known to the stevedore and would be neither obvious nor anticipated by a skilled stevedore who competently performs his job. So this case confirmed the availability of an open and obvious defense against a turnover duty to warn claim, but it didn't make clear when the open, open and obvious defense could be used in a more general turnover duty of safe condition claim. Some circuits have made their own tests for this. For instance, the Fifth Circuit says that a ship owner who turns over a ship with an open and obvious de defect does not breach his duty unless the hazard was practically unavoidable for the longshoreman. Some other circuits have said that the ship owner only breaches his duty if he turns over a ship with an open and obvious defect if he takes action that affirmatively acknowledges the defect, like trying to fix it. The Fourth Circuit has encountered the turnover duty of safe condition on many occasions, but it's never laid out clear rules for when an open and obvious defense can be used in the context of the turnover duty which is where this case comes in. So Bunn was a longshoreman assigned to cargo operations in Baltimore in February of 2013. And his operations had actually been delayed for several days because of a bad winter storm. But his boss was anxious to start work, so his boss went onto the ship and told the ship's chief officer that they were gonna need the ice to be treated so they could begin work. The ship's chief officer said that the crew would sand and salt the area between the holds. So then Bunn's boss went off the ship and after a few hours, instructed Bunn to go on and begin work. 
Keep in mind, his boss never went back on the ship to check if the ice had been treated, and the ship's crew never even attempted to treat the ice. So Bun went onto the ship, he loaded one hold successfully, and then he moved to another hold in a more dimly lit area of the ship. He ultimately slipped and fell on ice, injuring his back and his elbow. The district court held that Oldendorf was liable because he voluntarily and affirmatively undertook to remedy what was otherwise an open and obvious hazard, but failed to do so. And the jury ultimately awarded Bunn over $1.8 million in damages. So the case was appealed to the Fourth Circuit, who did affirm. The Fourth Circuit held that liability can attach to a ship owner if he promises to fix a hazard but fails to do so, even if the hazard is open and obvious. And the court noted that even though the ice was open and obvious in this case, it was not open and obvious that the ship owner would promise to treat the ice but fail to do so. The court also noted that although normally a longshoreman might anticipate to encounter ice following a winter storm, there was no reason for Bun to anticipate finding the ice after Oldendorf's promise to treat it. So in reaching this conclusion, the Fourth Circuit relied on case law from other circuits that have held a ship owner breaches his turnover duty when he affirmatively acknowledges an open and obvious defect. The court also said that holding the ship owner liable for promising yet failing to remedy a defect is in line with more accepted general principles of tort law. And finally, the Fourth Circuit said that the scope of the duty really depends on the facts and circumstances of each case, and the promise to treat the ice in this case was just one circumstance that defined the duty. At the end of their opinion, the Fourth Circuit entered into a long discussion of the duty to warn, but they emphasized that this was merely dictum and was not a basis for their holding. The case did elicit one dissent from Judge Motz, and she made several good points, several of which I expanded upon in my analysis. So overall, I think there are three main errors in the Fourth Circuit's reasoning in this case. First, the Fourth Circuit relied on factually and legally incongruous precedent from other circuits to reach their holding. In all the cases they relied on, the ship owner did much more than just make a promise, such as actually try to fix a defect, but ultimately fail to do so. More importantly, all the case law they rely on deals with the active operations duty, which is a completely separate Cyndia duty, and it deals with the ship owner's duties after operations have begun rather than before operations have begun. And moreover, the active operations duty involves a completely different standard for the ship owner. It doesn't matter if the hazard was avoidable or not, but only if the ship owner negligently exposed the longshoreman to hazards. The second main error in their reasoning was their reliance on general land-based tort principles, and this is one of the points the dissenting judge touches on in her opinion. The Supreme Court said in Cyndia that maritime negligence actions are not necessarily to be governed by principles which are applicable in non-maritime contexts. And even if these general tort principles might have been relevant before Cyndia, they certainly were not relevant after the Supreme Court in Cyndia laid out the only three ways a longshoreman can sue for negligence under the Act. So there is no reason for the Fourth Circuit to even enter into this independent analysis. The last error in their reasoning, and the one that I find the most troubling, was their assertion that the ship owner's promise to treat the ice transformed what was otherwise an open and obvious hazard into a latent hazard, thus changing the duty that the ship owner owed. The Supreme Court said in Cyndia that the duty the ship owner owes depends on the timing of the operations, <coughs> namely, have the operations begun, and who has control over the area or the instrumentality in question. The duty the ship owner owes does not, or at least should not, depend on what the ship's crew members said. I understand the court taking um, Bunn's reliance on this promise into account as a factor in its totality test, but that makes a lot more sense to me than saying that the nature of the hazard has changed as a matter of a law, a matter of law because of the promise. So overall, I think instead of adopting this broad totality of the circumstances test to determine whether a turnover of a ship with an open and obvious defect is a breach of its duty, the Fourth Circuit should adopt a narrower, more concrete test like some of the other circuits have done. Because in the application of the totality test in this case, the Fourth Circuit essentially created an additional ship owner duty, which it obviously should not have done since Cindy laid out the only three ways a longshoreman can sue a ship owner in negligence under the Act. I think this broad totality of the circumstances test threatens to severely increase ship owners' exposure to liability to longshoremen, which is exactly what Congress tried to get away from when it amended the act in 1972. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Brian Kitts. 
I'm a 2L at Tulane University Law School and a junior member of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. The case I chose for my case note is a 2013 Fifth Circuit decision called Mike Hook's Dredging, Mike Hook's Dredging v. Marquette Transportation. I decided to write on this case because we had just learned about the Pennsylvania rule in Professor Davis's um, Admiralty One class, and in doing my research, I found a decision here where the court applied the rule in a unique way, and it took place here in Louisiana, and I moved from there. <laughs> um, the Pennsylvania rule imposes a rebuttable presumption of causation against a vessel involved in a collision that is in violation of a statute or regulation intended to prevent collisions. Um, in Pennsylvania rule cases, the statutes or regula and regulations at issue are usually the coal regs or for inland waters, the inland navigation rules. The Pennsylvania rule can be rebutted, but it imposes a very high standard for rebuttal. A party only rebuts the Pennsylvania rule's presumption of causation if they prove that their statutory or regulatory violation could not have been the cause of the collision. Notably, the, Supreme <clears throat> the, Pencil the Pennsylvania rule survived the Supreme Court's decision in reliable transfer. In reliable transfer, the Supreme Court abandoned the divided damages rule. Under the divided damages rule, liability for maritime torts was equally divided among all at-fault parties. Thus, if there was a collision and one vessel was 80% at fault and another vessel was 20% at fault, liability for any damages would be equally shared among both parties. In place of the divided damages rule, the Supreme Court adopted a basic comparative fault liability regime. Initially, there was speculation that this abrogated the Pennsylvania rule. However, in a case, Judge John Brown noted that the Pennsylvania rule still floats in the wake of reliable transfer, and he was right. Courts continue to apply the Pennsylvania rule to this day. It hasn't gone anywhere. However, courts have, adopt, have adopted an important limitation on the Pennsylvania rule, the legal duty requirement. Under the legal duty requirement, the Pennsylvania rule will only be applicable if the statute or regulation imposes a legal duty. Courts applying the legal duty requirement have held that a statute or regulation does not impose a legal duty that allows for circumstantial judgment or interpretation by vessel operators. For example, in Interstate Towing v. Stesey, the Second Circuit held that the Pennsylvania rule was inapplicable against a tug because the legal duty requirement was not satisfied. That case involved a pilotage regulation that imposed a maximum length for tow lines. However, it allowed for the master of a vessel to approve the use of longer tow lines if he thought it necessary due to sea or weather conditions. The court concluded that this pilotage regulation did not impose a legal duty because it allowed for circumstantial judgment and interpretation by the vessel operator, and thus the Pennsylvania rule was not applicable. Similarly, in Tokyo Marine and Fire Insurance v. Flora, the Fifth Circuit concluded that the Pennsylvania rule was inapplicable to violations of Colreg 8C. Colreg 8C generally mandates that ships avoid close quarters situa situations, however it allows for the master to approve a close quarters situation if he thinks there is inadequate sea room to move the vessel. Again, the court concluded that Colreg 8C allowed for circumstantial judgment and interpretation by vessel operators and thus did not impose a legal duty. Accordingly, the Pennsylvania rule did not apply. The noted case, Mike Hook's dredging, involves this legal duty requirement. Here, a dredge, the Mike Hooks, began operations near the intersection of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway and Wax Lake. This is in the Atchafalaya Basin. It's about 100 miles southwest of New Orleans. While underway, a tow, the Sarah D, collided with the dredge. The dredge's, the dredge's crew then moved the vessel into the channel of the Wax Lake and began making repairs. While moored, another tow, the Pat McDaniel, collided with the Mike Hooks, causing further damage. The owner of the Mike Hooks brought suit for damages against the Pat McDaniel. In response, the owner of the Pat McDaniel brought counterclaims against the Mike Hooks. At trial, the Eastern District of Louisiana determined that the Mike Hooks violated Inland Navigation Rule 9G, which prohibits anchoring in narrow channels. Accordingly, the court applied the Pennsylvania Rule against the Mike Hooks found that it was unable to rebut the strong presumption of causation, and found the vessel 70% liable for damages. On appeal, the owner of the Mike Hooks argued that the lower court had misapplied the Pennsylvania rule. The Fifth Circuit disagreed. It concluded that Inland Navigation Rule 9G imposed a legal duty on vessels not to anchor in narrow channels, 
that the mic hooks violated that duty by mooring in the channel of the Wax Lake, and that it could not rebut the Pennsylvania Rules presumption of causation. The court concluded that Inland Navigation Rule 9G satisfied the legal duty requirement as part of the Inland Navigation Rule's comprehensive purpose of preventing collisions. This deviates from the jurisprudence of previous courts that have applied the legal duty requirement. Inland Navigation Rule 9G prohibits anchoring in narrow channels, I'm quoting, if the circumstances of the case admit. Plainly, this allows for circumstantial judgment and interpretation by vessel operators. It allows them to determine whether the circumstances of the case admit. In this sense, Inland Navigation Rule 9G is just like the pilotage reg regulation in interstate towing, and it's just like Colreg 8C in Tokyo Marine. The court's reasoning here obviates the legal duty requirement because any violation of a coal reg or inland navigation rule will satisfy the legal duty requirement. The coal regs are the collision regulations. The INRs, the inland navigation rules, are the coal regs almost verbatim applied on inland waters. They will always implicate a comprehensive purpose of preventing collisions. The court's decision is unfortunate because the Pennsylvania rule no longer serves a justifiable purpose in modern maritime law. A traditional justification for the Pennsylvania rule is that it equitably shifts the evidentiary burden to a party in statutory violation. In other words, a party will supply facts and evidence for use at trial when trying to rebut the Pennsylvania rule. Now, it's important to note that the Pennsylvania rule was created at a time when collisions often resulted in two vessels sinking, the crew drowning, and there being no appreciable way of gathering facts and evidence for trial. This is no longer the case. Modern vessels are equipped with voyage data recorders, they're equipped with GPS, they're equipped with radar, they're equipped with um, GPS and, and other modern technology that provide ample evidence of the facts and the conditions involved in a collision. Further, collisions don't automatically result in a vessel's capsizing anymore. Notably, at issue here, there was both a collision and an elision all vessels survived and were available for inspection and the crew were available for deposition and testimony. Also, the Pennsylvania rule is out of place in the post-reliable transfer comparative fault liability regime. Liability is now proportionally allocated according to fault. Under this system, a fact finder will take account of any relevant statutory or regulatory violation during their fault-based liability analysis. Finally, the Pennsylvania rule allows for abuse when applied against defendants. A plaintiff with a weak case can often proceed to trial simply, simply because the defendants can rarely overcome the Pennsylvania rule's very strong presumption of causation. In typical American tort law, the plaintiff has to put, prove his case. That should be the case for maritime collisions as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, David Moss. I'm an LLM candidate at the law school in the Admiralty program. I'm a junior member on the journal. The case I'm going to talk about is Blue Whale, the Grand China Shipping Development Company. This is a case decided last summer by the Second Circuit. Uh, the reason I chose this case was because it brings together three important issues in maritime litigation, and those are Rule B attachment, corporate veil piercing, and choice of law. The issue before the court in this case was when you use Rule B to attach property of a corporate alter ego, what substantive law applies to the veil piercing claim? So James talked about pleading standards with uh, respect to piercing the corporate veil. I'm gonna talk about choice of law. And I'll talk a little bit about the facts in this case that gave rise to the claim, what happened in the district court, and then ultimately what happened at the Second Circuit. So the facts uh, were these. There was a charter party made between Blue Whale and Grand China to transport iron ore from Brazil to China. And Blue Whale says that they never got paid, they suffered a million dollars, over a million dollars in damages as a result. The charter party had an English choice of law clause and a London arbitration clause. So, person to that clause, Blue Whale took their claim to arbitration in London. At the same time, they wanted to get some security for their expected arbitration award in the United States. Uh, Blue, uh, I'm sorry, Grand China didn't have any property in the Southern District of New York, but another company did, H&A. And it was another Chinese company, Blue Whale, alleged that H&A was Grand China's corporate alter ego. And so they sought a rule B attachment of H&A's uh, property in the Southern District of New York. 
Uh, H&A then uh, sought for uh, a hearing under Rule E4F to have the attachment vacated and uh, the district court vacated the award, vacated the attachment because they held that the English choice of law clause in the charter party applied to the veil-piercing claim and Blue Whale hadn't established under English law that H&A was Grand China's corporate alter ego. One of the requirements for a Rule B attachment is that you have a, a prima facie valid admiralty claim. And so the question arises, well, what law determines the sufficiency of a claim under that standard? There was authority in the Southern District uh, for the proposition that federal law always applies, which is kind of surprising. You would think if it's a contract claim, there's a choice of law provision in the contract, then that law should determine the sufficiency of the claim. But some courts had held that federal law is always the, is the standard you always use to measure the sufficiency of a claim, the theory being that performing a complicated choice of law analysis and possibly applying foreign law at that stage was inconsistent with the limited judicial inquiry uh, contemplated by an E4F hearing. So there's a division of, of authority within the Southern District over what, whether you apply foreign law or federal law always to determine the legal sufficiency, not just of a veil Pearson claim, but any claim in admiralty. Uh, when reviewing an attachment under Rule B. The case went up to the Second Circuit, and so they faced the question, well, first, is it always federal law when you're reviewing attachment? And then second, if not, is there a special rule for corporate identity? There was also some authority in the Second Circuit that uh, even if you were willing to apply foreign law as a general matter, well, when you're looking at questions of corporate identity, such as piercing the corporate veil, federal law applies automatically. And so you, you have this difficult choice of law question before the Second Circuit about what law applies. Now the reason all of this is important is that American law uh, is relatively liberal with respect to piercing the corporate veil. It is, it is much easier under American law to pierce the corporate veil than it is under most foreign laws, and in particular under English law, which is a common choice in charter parties and other maritime transactions. Under English law, you usually have to show either a specific intent to defraud or some very serious misconduct, um, which is higher than uh, the multi-factor test used by different American jurisdictions. Uh, so the choice of law issue is often sort of outcome determinative uh, with respect to whether you can pierce the corporate veil. And in turn, piercing the corporate veil is important because uh, as parties who participate in maritime transactions know, oftentimes on the other side you have to be facing a network of related corporate entities and you're not exactly sure with whom you're dealing or which of them is going to have the assets to satisfy a judgment. And so oftentimes if you want a recovery for your claim, you have to pierce the corporate veil. So both of these issues can be very important to uh, maritime litigants. The Second Circuit held first that federal law doesn't automatically apply to questions of legal sufficiency with respect to rule B attachment. So for example, if you had an ordinary contract claim and the contract provided for the application of foreign law in order to determine whether you had a, a sufficient claim to sustain a rule B attachment, you would have to look to that foreign law and that, foreign, that substantive foreign law would be the measure of sufficiency for the claim. Uh, interestingly though, the court held that in this case, the English choice of law provision did not apply to the veil piercing claim. And the reasoning was that claims related to corporate identity are collateral to contract claims. You're not really bringing a claim about the subject matter of the contract. The claim actually relates to the status of the party with whom you're dealing. It's outside, it's remote from the subject matter of the contract. So because of this uh, sort of collateral doctrine, the choice of law provision was irrelevant to the veil piercing claim. So then you fall back on, does, does federal law apply automatically to claims to pierce the corporate veil? Because some courts had held in the Second Circuit that federal law applies to all questions of corporate identity. And the court said no. The court said, in fact, you have to conduct a maritime choice of law analysis within the Loritz and Roditis framework, applying the factors and whatever foreign law is indicated, or American law, whatever the case may be, is indicated by those factors. That's the law you apply. Now, that could alarm many plaintiffs because the possibility of applying foreign law can make it a lot harder to bring these veil Pearson claims. The good news for them, at least in this case, was that the court said in the absence of a dominant foreign choice of law, federal law should apply. So federal law still enjoys sort of a default status. And if you remember the facts in, in the Luritzen case, it was a, a Jones Act case involving a Danish seaman on a Danish vessel, a Danish employer, employment agreement signed in Denmark. All of the foreign factors pointed to a, a single foreign jurisdiction. Now, it's unclear 
Short of a situation like that, where all of the factors point toward one foreign jurisdiction, when a court is going to be willing to apply foreign law to, to a veil piercing claim or, or to any claim at the rule B attachment stage. Uh, in this case, they were willing to say, well, you know, we have a few different options, none is particularly strong, so we'll stick with federal law. Um, the big open question after this case is when and under what circumstances they'll apply foreign law and whether that will make it more difficult, more cumbersome to review attachment at the E4F stage because of the possibility of applying foreign law, first conducting this choice of law analysis and then second applying foreign law, which uh, could be English law or could be something uh, less familiar to maritime practitioners and certainly to judges. So the, the big questions after this case are when and if future courts will apply foreign law and whether that will fundamentally change the nature of attachment review uh, at the rule E4F hearing. So that's it. Thank you very much. Good evening. I realize I'm the last thing keeping you for the reception, so I'll try to be as engaging as possible. Uh, my name is Graham Williams. I'm a 2L and a JM on the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. And I wrote my case note on Boudreau v. Transocean, which is a 2013 case out of the Fifth Circuit. I chose this case out of a stack of recommendations because while I knew very little about maintenance and cure at the time, it struck me as unfair. Um, so in this presentation, I'd like to walk you through the facts of Boudreau v. Transocean and the holding, and then I'd like to set up a little bit of a legal background, and then I'd conclude with three of what I think are the more interesting points of my case note. So in Boudreau v. Transocean, Wallace, Tran oh, excuse me. Wallace Boudreau's employer had been paying maintenance and cure for five years when it finally realized that it could establish a valid McCorpin defense. So it moved for summary judgment on, uh, on the maintenance and cure payments. The district court granted summary judgment, and then it moved for a counterclaim for restitution of those payments already made. And the district court granted this under general maritime law. Well, on appeal, the parties reached a bracketed settlement uh, conditional upon whether Transocean could have established an automatic right of restitution. Um, this is a fairly novel idea. There is some precedent in the Ninth Circuit, but the idea that this would be an automatic right is a fairly novel concept. Uh, ultimately, the Fifth Circuit held that you could not have an affirmative, um, an affirmative judgment against the seaman you can only use an offset against damages already paid. So I'd like to set up a brief uh, legal background for you. As you all know, a maritime employer has to pay maintenance and cure for any seaman who is injured or becomes ill while in service of the vessel. Uh, regardless of who's at fault, this is an intrinsic and inherent part of the employment relationship. And an employer can only defend against or mitigate a maintenance and cure claim in very specific ways. So one of the ways is by investigating a claim for maintenance and cure before commencing payment. There's a pitfall there. Uh, if you maliciously withhold maintenance and cure payments, you can be held punitively liable. Um, but that is one of the alternatives. Another option is, um, excuse me, uh, oh, you can use an offset. So if, you, if you've paid damages for Jones Act or unseaworthiness, you can offset uh, to the extent that the damages would be duplicative. And lastly, you can establish a McCorpin defense, which is ultimately what my case note addresses. So to establish a McCorpin defense, an employer has to show that a seaman intentionally misrepresented or concealed medical facts during the hiring process, uh, that, that, that those facts were pertinent to the hiring decision, and that there's a connection between those concealed facts and the injury that is complained of. So McCorpin allows an employer to stop paying or to deny a claim for maintenance and cure but it leaves open the question of those payments already made before the McCorpin defense is established. So I'd like to walk you through three points of criticism. First, the court relies very heavily on a holding, a Supreme Court holding, still the Norfolk uh, Western Railway Company. And still the Supreme Court is grappling with a FILA claim. And while a while railroad employee was fraudulent, the court held that his employment relationship had not been sufficiently vitiated to the extent that he couldn't bring a claim under FILA. And while FILA cases are applicable to the Jones Act, the court, I think, wrongly relies on this as an appropriate analog. So while it makes sense for uh, pursuant to the still holding to allow a seaman to still bring a Jones Act claim after a McCorpin defense has been established, it doesn't necessarily apply to maintenance and cure because they're very different. Um, the, the, holding in FILA, the holding in still is a FILA case where you have to establish fault. In maintenance and cure, 
does not take fault into account. Uh, secondly, the holding in still is based on whether a seaman can uh, initial, initiate a, um, an act under FILA as opposed to whether he is able to protect himself against uh, a claim for restitution. So the, uh, sorry, a, a, a claim from his employer for those payments already made. So I don't think this is really an appropriate analog, uh, which the court heavily relies on. Secondly, I would criticize the court for conflating a right to investigate with a duty to investigate. The court criticizes Transocean for failing to discover the opportunity for a McCorpin defense earlier on. The seaman himself, however, is under a duty to disclose this medical information. So in light of that duty, a court's recognition of a duty to investigate on the part of the employer would encourage a seaman to sit back and wait to see if the employer ultimately discovers that information. While the duty of proving fraud already lies with the employer, it's not, necessarily, it's not necessary to enforce the employer to investigate quickly. Fraud discovered early in litigation, I would argue, is the same as fraud if discovered later. A duty to investigate would not serve the interests of justice and would have a pernicious effect on the truthfulness of uh, injured semen. And lastly, I would point out that the court's decision betrays a logical in inconsistency. In McCorpin, the court holds that upon the establishment of a McCorpin defense, the, the plaintiff has no right to maintenance and cure. However, in this case, the court holds that the employer has no right to get those payments back. So if the seaman has no right to the payments and the employer has no right to get them back, their legal status becomes unclear. Is the seaman allowed to keep payments merely because once, it, once offset has been exhausted, no one can take them away? Or alternatively, if the court is holding that the seaman has a right to those payments, but only to those payments already received, then the seaman's right is determined by the arbitrary factor of time. Two seamen, subject to the identical decisions, could have widely different rights based on the speed of litigation. This would encourage plaintiff's attorneys to litigate very slowly and defendant's attorneys to litigate very rapidly. And I think such an arbitrary determination of rights would decrease predictability for employers, thereby passing on costs to the maritime industry at large. In either case, the court betrays a logical inconsistency, which would be easily resolved through the recognition of the automatic right of restitution. So in conclusion, I think that the question deserves further scrutiny. But from my understanding of the case law, I would assert that an employer should have an automatic right to restitution upon the establishment of a McCorpin defense. Thank you. Graham falsely advertised that he was the last thing standing between you and the reception. Uh, I am the last thing standing between you and the reception. I'm David Meyer, the dean at Tulane. Uh, and I, my job in closing is simply, uh, above all, to thank uh, Ray Wade and Listo and Lewis uh, for hosting uh, this opportunity and uh, to thank the American Bar Association as well uh, for webcasting this program. I want to congratulate our students, the, the members of the journal, uh, and if you'll indulge me, uh, a brief word of uh, pride in the work that they have done uh, in showcasing uh, the talent of our students uh, and the strength of the maritime program at Tulane. Uh, the journal is, uh, is, of course, the flagship of, uh, of our maritime program, uh, and uh, we're enormously proud of it. And I am doubly pleased to be able to share this moment of pride as well as I look out and see uh, some of the founders of the journal who are here, and I hope I know that you will share the pride in, in seeing that what you have created uh, in this journal uh, and contributing to the Maritime Law Program at Tulane has sort of taken this new form uh, in sharing uh, the knowledge and research uh, that's being generated at Tulane uh, with, uh, with other lawyers around the world. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Congratulations to our students, uh, and now now, please come to the reception. Thank you.